We started with eight competitors, and now we are down to our last two. They're a pair of familiar faces, and it's time to find out which of them will be getting their last spot here for the BlizzCon Spots for Europe. Let's meet our first contestant hailing from Manchester, United Kingdom. Please welcome to the stage, George C. And his opponent, hailing from Ukraine, also a finalist, also coming here to the stage once again for the Grand Finals. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Hippie. All right, gentlemen, we'll keep this short and sweet. George, you're back for another season, but this time you're getting to the Grand Finals. This is where you go to BlizzCon if you take it all. What's going through your mind right now? Just got to play as best as I can. I'm favored on paper, so that's all I can do. And Dr. Hippie, you've been to this spot before, so people can't really call you the mysterious challenger. What are you then? Uh, I don't know. I'm the player. I'm a member of Team Vix Pro, so let's go. Woo, let's go. That's Dr. Hippie for you. Go ahead and shake hands, gentlemen. And may the best man win. Let's send off this championship and find out who is going to BlizzCon. Thank you, Frodo. And I'm Raven, joined by Subtle, of course. And we have the absolute pleasure to cast this finals. I cannot wait. Yeah, two UK casters casting a UK grand finalist. We did it. Brexit be damned, Raven. <laughs> we did it, boys. Yeah, we managed quite the unbelievable feat in itself. But now these two players have quite a feat to manage as well. As you know, we see Hippie the second time in the finals. Mm -hmm. That's a huge achievement, but he does have to take down George C if he wants to play against Naaman at BlizzCon, as he mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's it. And yeah, this is a, it's a battle of legacies here. Dr. Hippie trying to get that revenge against Naaman and uh, George C trying to follow in the footsteps of the, the man that he can't stand <laughs> being compared to, the Amnesiac, the youngest player to qualify so far. But, you know, George C does get a reputation as the, as the UK Amnesiac, so he needs to live up, step into those shoes now. But both of these players, as we mentioned in the pre-show, just incredible levels of consistency to have got them here time after time. Yeah, you cannot argue with the results so far. And also for George, this is his breakout performance, right? You know, that did be mentioned very briefly in his interview that, yeah, he's you know, plays Virtus Pro, you know, very well-known team now, a bit of a power team knocking around Hearthstone. And George C has the opportunity to really move forward in his Hearthstone career, but we are underway. It's gonna be George C on his mage, which is freeze. And Doc Tippy on his tempo mage, and you know this is like this is actually the matchup I wanted to see, just uh, just because both players are so known for their mage play, mm -hmm. but Doc Tippy actually you know, deviating from his strategy and going for the tempo list. Yeah, I echo the sentiments. I also wanted to see this matchup uh, line up because, you know, George C said that Dr. Hippie was scared of his freeze mage. And then when, when we heard from Dr. Hippie, he said if this matchup of the mages happened, then his tempo mage was going to be favored, which I think remains to be seen. But I personally want to see Dr. Hippie exposed as the coward that he is here <laughs> for backing out wow. of the freeze mage strategy. But that is not a coward's hand. That is the hand of a winner double Mana Worm and the coin in Tempo Mage. The absolute dream. Yeah, and also there's the backup plan that you can just Kabbalist Tome into Freeze Mage cards and we'll have a Freeze Mage mirror on our hands. Ooh. Ooh. We found a usage for Kabbalist Tome. <laughs> it lets you role play as a Freeze Mage. <laughs> yeah, that's seems Brilliant. pretty fine. Solved it. Yeah, so Dr. Tippy again taking his time and rightly so, but I imagine the Mana Worm coin. Mana Worm is the strongest play you can possibly make in this matchup as well. Never mind in general. Yep, I mean, there was a brief consideration there from Dr. Hippie. We saw in his day one proceedings that he roped out every turn, at least for the first game, as a deliberate strategy to try and take like a Balls out of his comfort zone a little bit. But we heard from him that he wasn't going to be doing any of that today. So that seemed like a very genuine decision there about whether he wanted to load up on this pressure early on. Or that coin with the Flame Waker already in his hand represents two damage. So it's reasonable to hold on to it. But he's valuing having this extra Mana Worm on the board as more than two damage, which is almost certainly the case. Yeah, and the power of this build of Tempo Mage is that it's, uh, that I'm calling it Tempo Mage, that it's naturally slower, right? So you yep. can make those decisions not to have to go all in early on. See the babbling book 
Um, and they're that Arcane Blast, so nice flexible tool for him to use there so far. Yep, perfectly reasonable. And George C is just having to react to these Mana Worms a little bit late here. Missed on his Frost Bolts. He's had some uh, pretty powerful draws in this tournament so far, uh, including in rehearsals. He had some crazy draws <laughs> with his Freeze Mage as well, as we noticed, uh, especially against aggro decks. But little bit of a slow hand on this occasion, which is allowing Dr. Hippie to take the initiative here with his Freeze Mage and kind of uh, back up those early statements that he felt like he would be favored if this matchup came up. Yeah, and this is the kind of pressure he's putting him under. He's just going to play a fame. Uh, Flame Waker after seeing the first torch come out and say, if you don't kill this Flame Waker, you could just die in the next turn or so, as that's the oh. kind of pressure you really do apply. And now it's a bit of a whiff turn for Dr. Hippie. Antonide is going to be useful later on, potentially, but the Arcane Blast from the Babbling Book combined with a Frost Bolt and an Arcane Missiles. You know, I'm all, I'm all up for smoking, so, but... Mm. <laughs> There's certain things you need to consider of just arcane missiles for three to face. Yeah, I mean, if the Flame Waker had have lived, then this would have actually been an incredibly powerful turn. He would have just basically put the pressure on George C, be threatening lethal for the rest of the game just with the amount of damage here. But this is where you have to bring into question how experienced is Dr. Hippie with this deck? Because we, we've made the point throughout this weekend, he is not, he is very inexperienced with this deck list, but this is where a Tempo Mage expert excels. How do you turn the hand of Frostbolt, Arcane Blast, Arcane Missiles into a winning hand? Yeah, and also one of the problems is, even if you practice with it for a couple of weeks, how often do you run into Freeze Mage? Fair Just point. Not, not that often at all, but you could go the other way and say he doesn't need to run into any Freeze Mages because he is a Freeze Mage at heart. He is the Freeze Mage. You either, you're either Freeze Mage or you aren't. And Dr. Hippie, I'm afraid, has exposed himself as not Freeze Mage. Yeah, did buckle a little bit, but that is a pretty good draw. As it your is. Drake allows him to actually do something this turn worthwhile, which is always you know, something to aim for when you play in Hearthstone. It is a pretty basic component of a good Hearthstone turn is to do something worthwhile. And yeah, 4-4 four, four on the board, draw a card, not too bad, but still his hand just looks a little bit clunky. And that is a weakness of this slower build of Tempo Mage is that it just is exposed to these clunky draws. You have your Emperors, your Double Tome, your Archmage Antonidas, and now the Yogg-Saron all building up in hand. But he does still have a, a little bit more burst damage with the Arcane Missiles, but now with that Ice Barry in play, Dr. Hippie chooses not to even push the one with his Babbling Book. That means he's in an all-out burn plan with spells and that he does not think he's winning this game through melee damage anymore. Yeah, and you know what? I can actually get behind that idea. He has Antoninus and two one-mana spells, mm -hmm. so he can wait. And he does run Emperor in this deck as well, so he can reduce them down even further to squeeze in a quicker turn. If, say, he drew it this turn, it would be a fantastic Emperor turn to really power the pressure on and pretty much guarantee a block proc. And outside of Alexstrasza, you're just in ping range a lot of the time. If you can proc him down, there's no other way to heal out for George C. So this time he does bail out and chooses to attack with the Azure Drake since it's stuck to the board. So um, him leaving up the Ice Barrier on the previous turn may have just been a consideration. You know, he, he for, for the cost of one damage, he was willing to make George C's life a little bit awkward and leave his own flexibility open. So he allowed himself just to go with straight burn damage. He also said to George C, if you have another Ice yeah. Barrier in your hand, you are not allowed to play it. But now since the Drake stuck, he's going to go back to the melee attacks. And we saw a uh, an Arcane Blast with double spell damage come out there, Raven. In your, in your professional Hearthstone opinion, one mana, six damage, good card? Uh, reasonable, yeah, okay. reasonable. I think it's uh, playable at least. Nice. It did clear up the Emperor pretty well, and now, oh, okay. So Dr. Hippie has his own Emperor. So he can actually just drop it down now. He's not even under any pressure, and George C's hand is so low mm -hmm. at the moment that, you know, I think it's just a pretty easy Emperor this turn. Yeah, this is a great hand, actually, because next turn he'll have eight mana and he will be able to play uh, six, six mana Antonidas, one mana Sorcerer's Apprentice, which means even two mana spell draws will be playable on the next turn with, a, with an Antonidas turn mm. to turn them into fireballs. So that is a pretty good looking Emperor hand overall. And also, how does George C kill any of these minions at the moment? Because even Emperor, the one that's given an active, like huge problem, yeah. is just, he's just not really gonna die. There's nothing, unless there's another fireball drawn, because he's already used one. Mm -hmm. He's already used one of the torches, so he does have a second, uh, he has a rowing torch in the deck. But yeah, like, how do you even kill Emperor at this point? Blizzard is drawn off the Arcane Intellect there to slow them, uh, like the actual minion damage down, but this Emperor's gonna get another tick, and this is extremely scary when it's ticking on after an Antonida spell. 
Sure is, and there is a babbling book that could potentially, again, now if it picks up a, a one-mana spell or a zero-mana, even Forbidden Flame can uh, provide some extra fuel to the Antonidas here alongside the, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Flame Lance not quite going to get the job done with the added insult of just not being able to go face. Yeah, the so the difference between a one-mana six damage, as we spoke about Hurricane Blast spell power earlier, yeah. and a five-mana eight damage to minion is uh, a little bit big. He's just probably not going to get most utilization. It is a kill for Alex Straza, though. Just, That's just as like, uh, you know, it's definitely not great, but it will have a use if the game goes late. But Doc Tippy has pretty much positioned himself where the game is not going to go late at this rate. No, picks up Evolved Kobold. We haven't really talked too much about the specific build of Freeze Mage that George C is running. He is running this, this spell damage heavy, faster version that just quite often goes OTK from 30 without even using the Alexstrasza. So um, the Evolved Kobold picked up now, but just nowhere near the pile of burn in hand that he needs. No ice block in sight either. And that is going to be game one to Dr. Hippie. Dr. Hippie living up to his words and making me eat mine. The Tempo Mage beats the Freeze. And I picked Hippie to win, so it's going okay for me so far. And look at that trophy as well. They have it in front of them. Mm -hmm. This is what the, the guys are playing for, the trophy and the spot into BlizzCon for the Grand Finals overall. And this is huge for both these players. And Hippie gets the, the win. I think both of these players have the two Mage decks they feel they need to win with in terms of getting ahead in the series overall. Yeah, and just looking at the scene now, very different stance from from Dr. Hippie. I think in the last series, he was he was very much, uh, you know, he was turning around, he was making faces at us, he was all smiles, but I think now he's realizing that he's closing in on that ambition for the, the rematch with Neyman at BlizzCon. It's all becoming very real for him. Yeah, everything gets uh, super serious now. Even a character like George C, as you mentioned, I mean, even with the interview, he came over and he was like, you know, like, it's really, like, happy, of course, about getting into the finals, mm. but really nervous. And as, as you said, none of that laid-back approach now. We are, they are playing for everything here as they are getting ready to lock in the next deck. So we can see that the Warrior were banned out for both players here. So yeah. considering Dr. Tippy has not had the best performance with his Dragon Warrior this tournament, uh, interested to see the ban come out. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting uh, choice from George C. But he's been, you know, banning Warrior pretty consistently throughout. But yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's a testament to George C. as a, as the way he thinks about the game, where you know he's not going to be results oriented, right? Yeah. He's not going to look at the deck and say it's performed poorly for him. He is going to have come into this tournament with a strategy. In fact, you know, we've we've heard him backstage, you know, kind of. Um, you know, berating and, and harassing other players, saying, oh, well, what was your strategy? What was your plan coming into this tournament? What does your lineup do? So he's very adamant that you have to have a consistent strategy with your lineup. And if his strategy said ban Warrior, he's going to ban Warrior. That's yeah. that's what his game plan is. And he's done well for him so far as this is the finals of Dr. Tippy versus George C. Dr. Tippy's 1-0 up at the moment as we get into game two. And George is locking the freeze mage in again, and he does run into the shaman of Dr. Tippy. He does indeed run into the Shaman of Dr. Hippie. <laughs> Don't you start. Come on. While we're over here, you can defend me. And that's it. Tunnel Trog on turn one with the curving into Totem Golem here. George C sees, has nightmares of Totem Golem, wakes up in cold sweats at the mere thought of the card. So he is not going to be pleased to see this 3-4 come down right here that he just does not have an answer to. No, and you can already see him using the Frostbolt there to clear off the Tunnel Trog because to some extent it's just as much of a threat if you leave it alive. And yeah, yeah the follow-up from the Tunnel Golem is not going to be great for George. Does draw into the Ice Block though, so he does have one available for later on to be able to get it active. It's just going to choose to cycle this turn. The ping not really accomplishing much. Now I wonder, if you're Dr. Hippie here, how much of a consideration is just on curve Maelstrom Portal here because it protects your Totem Golem from Forgotten Torch. Yeah, I love it. You Great And you develop a minion. Right. Yeah, exactly. Great recognition of the situation. And now all you have to do is protect that Buccaneer for two more turns and then draw your Doomhammer. <laughs> GG. That would actually be pretty insane. But yeah, I completely agree. There's how many targets are there for Maelstrom Portal against Freeze Mage? Yeah. Like really just not a lot at all. And as you said, quite rightly defends the health onto the Totem Golem, and now it's all on George C to be able to defend himself. And he has Ice Barrier now, and even the Blizzard for the slightly later portions of the game to slow the ball down, but it might not be good enough as 
Doc Tippy just wants to get the minion damage in now, and then, as you said, locking that Doom Hammer, you know, locking the extra burn as well. It's going to be yeah. very difficult for Judge Seed to yeah, pull actually, out. Since this, this is the mid range, he actually doesn't have a Doom Hammer in oh, the deck. Oh, this is what I get for trusting you. I know. I trusted I you. It would have this to, once. It would have to be a Spirit Clause, which is a little bit less exciting, but, but still so. interesting nonetheless. But yeah, there's no Doom Hammer in the deck, unfortunately. I'll but never trust you ever again. I'm sorry. You trusted me before. That's a mistake. No, this was my first try. Oh, I see. And yeah. this is what I get. Misplay. Yeah. 0% uh, win rate on that trust. Yep. But the Ice Barrier is going to be proxed now as Dr. B does continue to develop minions onto the board with that Azure Drake and getting all the spell power buffs he could want for now at least. Nova picked up, not a bad tool here, but you know, this board just requires answers immediately. He just cannot leave all this spell damage in play and just cleaning up, you know, bit by bit here, but it's very, very slow. He's playing a long way from behind here, but his hand does start to improve as time goes on here. And Dr. Hippie has just picked up a few whiffs over the last few turns. His pressure has diminished. Two hexes and a lightning storm in hand now. Yeah, definitely not the yeah, you know, being able to just pile on enough pressure that he would want to, but if I'm honest. All I really want to see at this point from George C is the Evolved Cobalt come into play in some respect. He has been talking about this card. George C <laughs> made, made me a promise. Yeah. Even if he wins this tournament, if the promise does not come to fruition, I, I deem him a failure. He has told me there will be a Tempo Evolved Cobalt played in this Hearthstone tournament. Yeah, we've, we've trusted him with this, but maybe he'll let us down. I just think like that you did. might actually be an even bigger <laughs> yeah. misplay than trusting me, to be honest. Yeah, it's been, been a weekend of it so far, but the Flame Tongue Totem there going to continue to pile on the pressure. George C, 16 health now, and really just not a fantastic answer. The Blizzard's going to clear up the Totems and the Buccaneer, but leave this Totem Golem that seemingly is immortal yeah. at this point onto the board. And again, Blizzard's a fantastic card for slowing down the minions, freezes them, deals two damage to everything on the opponent's side of the board, of course, but it's his whole turn. So I made the comment about George C waking up in cold sweats about Totem Golems. That Totem Golem was played on turn two and has attacked every turn starting at turn three, so it's dealt 12 damage this game. You can understand <laughs> yeah. why this man is not a fan of the Totem Golem. Yeah, both times he's been here, there's been issues with that card yeah. on George C's end. And now he's just going to take his time and work out exactly what he needs to do to win. Because this is the sign of, you know, an exceptional player. Right. Being behind and knowing exactly you're out to win the game. And we've seen it a lot this weekend in terms of a lot of the, for example, the Rogue play. It's very much like, right, now I need to turn it on and go all in. So the decision here, he chose to go with uh, Forgotten Torch and a ping over using the Blizzard. So he obviously doesn't feel like he's going to have time to ping on a follow-up turn. He feels like his mana is going to be fairly well allocated from now on because even if he blizzards that board, the Flame Tongue Totem is still a big enough threat that at some point he has to commit a ping to it. Yeah. So just dealing with it straight up that turn means that now he has a little bit more flexibility available to him in his mana usage in these turns moving forward, which since he has a great deal of card draw in his hand and an ice block that needs to be developed at some point, all pushing forward towards that Alexstrasza, you know, making sure your mana usage is as tight and compact as possible is a really big deal in these mid-game freeze mage situations. Yeah, and in terms of the mana usage here for Georgie, Ooh. onto seven mana means he's got a or potentially a bit of a awkward turn to line up the blizzard again leaves him one mana short and you never really want to float mana yeah it's freeze mage you need to use every single point to optimize your turn but it was what he needed to do here and to be honest if i don't see cobbled frost nova next turn then i'm gonna be an unhappy caster <laughs> <laughs> it could happen cobbled brings out hex that's what we want to see um, I'm not ruling it out, but <laughs> Dr. Hippie, though, these last two couple of draws, or at least the, the two cards on the right-hand side of his hand are of the utmost important here because the left-hand side of his hand are just not the cards you want to be drawing in this matchup. They're all the reactive tools, the, to the, you know, the anti-control tools and then the anti-aggro tool of the Lightning Storm. So without this additional pressure that he's picked up with the Thunder Bluff and the Tuscar on the recent draws, he would might just find himself running out of steam here. Yeah, and two goes at the Totem and not getting the Healing Totem is actually pretty huge as well because it means that the tunnel trog at least is just pingable to just remove straight off the board right. and start off. But there are also considerations now for George C as to whether he can hold off, get the ice block yes. this turn, and then build into the damage the following turn to end the game. And it looks like this could well be the plan. And it's a, this is a great decision. This is, it, I mean, this isn't a hugely high level recognition, but it's a, you know, it's a mistake some rookie freeze mage players might make. There is no need to play Doomsayer here to try and clear this board. For one, 
your opponent has been holding a bunch of cards on the left-hand side of their hand in mid-range shaman yeah. the whole time. I wonder what those cards could right. be. <laughs> so a lot of the time that Doomsayer is going to bite the dust anyway. And secondly, because you are now setting up an ice block that will it. never get popped going into your turn nine, you are trying to set up the auto strategy of just Alex Straza go face and then burn it down. You already have 12 of that necessary damage in hand. Yeah, and it's, you know, this is the choice now for George C. Do you just slam Alex Straza? And, and hope against hope that you're going to draw into the burn because one of the issues he's got is if he play if he doesn't play Alex Straza this turn his opponent's just not going to be in range mm -hmm. but then if he does play Alex Straza then he can't play anything else to help cycle through like the loot hoarder like the arcane intellect it's an yeah, extremely it's tough. tough call it really is he does have arcane intellect available to him but that would be you know all three of his three remaining mana that's left outside of the roaring torch and the fireball that he has to follow it up so those two burn spells that he has are 12 damage uh, he'll be looking for a, a frost bolt to add to it also the evolved cobalt a little bit too expensive right now so even emperor thorasan as a pickup you know would have potentially given him given him some outs here but I, I'm, I'm not seeing too much of a line beyond just play your odds here in Alex Straza, and it looks like that's the conclusion that George has come to as well. Yeah, I, th I feel if you don't go for it, you need to hit too many other options to be able to make it work. So, yeah, it looks like he's hovering over it. He's going to commit to Alex Straza and then just poke the totem for one. Why not? Yeah, so his block is just up on the board. There, He has no illusions that he's keeping his ice block this turn. 14 damage in play, you know, plus the, uh, the 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 Thunder Bluff buff if uh, Dr. Hippie was able to make space. So the, the ice block will go down for sure this turn. Um, so he, Dr. George C is on limited numbers of outs here. He can buy himself time with you know potentially Frost Novas, potentially Ice Block number two. He has mm -hmm. the immediate burnout of just picking up Frost Bolt. Uh, he also has chances to redraw for that with the Arcane Intellect and with the Loot Hoarder ping to try and grab some of those things to stall for a turn as well. But this is just necessary with Freeze Mage in a lot of situations. You cannot wait for security if you're going to have a high win rate with this deck. Sometimes you just have to play your outs, and that is what George C. did in this situation. Yeah, he has got the Frost Nova, and of course, George can... Oh, my God, the next card was Torch. That's kind of crazy. So he does have the Frost Nova, and he has an Ice Lance. So he can lock out any form of weapons, Conan. But the problem is... Do you feel that's safe enough? Because you know you kill him next turn, so you can use all of your mana yes. on, on just the defensive options here. Yes. So the two plays this turn are Loot Hoarder, ping your own Loot Hoarder, draw exactly second Ice Block, 100% mm -hmm. win rate if you draw the Ice Block, one out of how many cards are left. Then the other play is, as you said, freeze the entire board plus the face, and then your win rate is whatever your opponent's likelihood of drawing Lightning Bolt is. So it's a simple calculation to make if you're in George C's position, and 12. I'm trusting him. 12 cards left in George's deck? Yep. Yeah, so it's a simple calculation to make, and George, with the correct, with the complete information, I'm sure is making the highest win rate play in this situation. Uh, but unfortunately, on this occasion, the numbers are not in his favor. Nope, Doc Tippy has. He had the second rock batter as well, but he's had that lightning bolt in his hand for a long time, and that is going to be used to end game two. And Doc Tippy's going 2 0 up in a very fast series so far versus George C. Yep, and it is the Freeze Mage that is suffering, you know, and that is one of the big stories of this grand finals is these are the two Freeze Mage players, one of them had the, the, the bravery, the security, or perhaps the folly of bringing <laughs> Freeze Mage with him, and one of them bailed out and switched to the Yogg Mage. So the fact that it's Freeze Mage that's a sticking point for George is a very big deal right now. Yeah, and we're going to find out if George can get a win with that Freeze Mage right after this. So don't go anywhere, guys. Welcome back, everyone, to the finals the European Summer Championship. If uh, Hearthstone is going to be Doc Tippy versus George C. Doc Tippy is 2 0 up and he's continuing to get wins versus this Freeze Mage. Can George C bag a win here? Yeah, I mean, looking at the remaining decks, the Warrior is banned, so he has Freeze Mage up against potentially uh, Miracle Rogue and the Token Druid from, from Dr. Hippie. And uh, the Token Druid is a pretty scary matchup, even though the healing isn't there and in full force like it is in the Malagos Druid. There's so much extra pressure, yeah. and it often feels like if you miss one freeze turn against their, their mid-game you know, explosions of power, then you just lose your block like straight away a lot of the time. So... 
Um, I, it's, that's a tough matchup for sure, but you know we saw a big point for George in the previous series that he talked about in his interview with yourself is that he was able to get that freeze mage to line up against the Miracle Rogue, and in this case, it's just not happening for no. him. Doctor Hippie is just refusing. He's just saying, "No, George, you are a stubborn individual. You're going to keep queuing that freeze mage, and I am not going to give you the rogue." Yeah, as we get into the third game, Doctor Hippie, like you said, choosing the druid first against George C's Freeze Mage, and this is Judge C's third go at taking a win with this deck. Starting off with a Raven Idol, Dr. Tippy going straight into Ramp, which is one of the sort of most common uh, sort of outcomes for the turn one. Raven Idol, you aim for the wild growth if you don't already have it to try and continue your ramp up and really pile the pressure on. And talking of pressure, two of the cards that perform very well in this matchup are those two guards you see on the far left, the big boys, the arcane giants. Yeah, there is a ticking time bomb in the left-hand <laughs> side of Dr. Hippie's hand right now as those giants count down to uh, to playable levels. And you know, Freeze Mage just cannot interact with huge minions like that apart from through Doomsayer. So Dr. Hippie will probably be looking for the insurance policy of the way to deal with a Doomsayer in his hand before he makes that big push. But there's also just a long way to go because he doesn't want the giants in his opening hand. He wants to draw them after cycling through his nourishes, yep. after cycling, yeah, after ramping with his wild growths, after innovating out minions and casting his Raven Idols. Then you tear those giants off the top and they're just immediately two mana, drop them alongside something else. Two that's mana? I want zero mana. Is it, wow, I mean, that that's just greedy. Well, really. I'm sorry. I'm you, not really sorry. You can't have it all, I'm afraid. Well, I want it all, Sol. The innovate there is actually, sorry, the coin there is actually going to be huge to get into that Ancient of War because, as you said, the rest of the hand just looking a little bit a little bit slow, whereas George, he's getting yeah. off to a relatively quick start with a double loot holder, putting pressure on. The Druid's on 24 already and just helping out with the cycle. But yeah, the this, it's a bit of a roadblock. Right, the hand has fallen apart just a <laughs> little bit here. And uh, looks like George C is, is going to play out the ice block here before attacking with his second loot hoarder. So he's not mm. interested in learning what his draw is first. Kind of interesting to me. Is he just choosing not to attack with the loot hoarder? It does seem that way. Hmm. So the idea here is that if there's fireball ping next turn, mm -hmm. then well, Doc Tippy will kind of want to kill this loot hoarder, right? You can, don't just want to leave it up. So then sure. is George presenting the idea of, well, you trade into the loot hoarder for me, and that means you've got to use some some kind of resource, whether mana for hero power or the attack from the Ancient of War. Right, but, you know, you're weighing that kind of very, very niche little mind game into, you know, not having full information about your turn by drawing a card. So yeah. I, guess, I guess what George is saying is that there is no play for five mana or less that would change my ice block yeah. ping turn this turn, in which case I value that little mind game above my extra card draw. So I guess it's reasonable, but it's just kind of a, a weird looking situation. Yeah, definitely not a standard play no. at all. Ice Barrier, pretty easy to just slip in this turn. Again, just not much George can do as his hand sort of fell to pieces towards the end here. And does have both secrets active though, so he's going to heal for quite a lot, even though Doc Tippy is piling on the pressure on the board now. And if he really wants, he could just Raven Idle into a giant. Pro caster tip, Raven. In, in this matchup, when someone casts Fandral into Raven Idle, keep an eye out for Eater of Secrets, because it's quite <laughs> important. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is this going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> it did last week, and TJ and I sat in these very seats. I am aware. Somehow, <laughs> just did not see it. For like four turns, it was sat Look, in the hand. I have no idea. They brought in the big guns for you, so I've got it covered. Don't worry. All right, cool. I'm, I'm glad you're here to watch my back. You have you have carried me throughout my career, Raven. So. Uh, like, again, just yet another recording I'm going to keep. <laughs> of you. I've got, I'm starting to start these up, so you need to be afraid. I'm going to make a, a montage. Fandral Raven Idol into Fandral! No That's oh the greatest God. thing I've ever seen in my life. That's kind of scary, actually. Although the second, the spell pick, not too fancy, but I suppose Naturalize is just a very... Oh, he's gone for the... Uh, Savagery, interesting. I didn't know if Naturalize, although giving the mm. card draw for the mage never feels great, it's a one mana answer to an awkward Doomsday turn when you're building up a board. It, it is, but you know, this this particular version of the deck is, is so uh, combo based and an all in that giving your opponent two more cards, you will very, very often just die to a Cobalt OTK if you let that happen. Very right? true. So, um, I can understand not wanting the Naturalize and the Savagery. You know, it can be combined with a, a Feral Rage that he has in the deck potentially, but <sighs> Fandral lives on the board. We, you know, he could he could just get all the Fandrals right now, <laughs> just just start going in. 
Your choose one effects <laughs> work twice? And it, it, it doesn't work Seems like that. Seems good. <laughs> uh, it does not work like <laughs> Yeah, just to confirm, it actually doesn't. But the Nourish hmm. always looks good. Uh, but there is a lot of cards already in hand now. And yeah, okay, Dr. Pete's actually just going for a Giant. And as we said, this is the point, although the Giant wasn't wasn't my old zero mana giant I was really after. Yeah. Um, although the giant wasn't zero mana, look at this board. Like now, George C. There was a chance to clear up the other three minions through, you know, combinations of a second blizzard and maybe just a ping here and there. But the giant is just it's just going to stick around and he's probably just not going to be killed for at all or at least quite a while. George C. Is very very fast approaching critical mass himself here though. With the, the Alex Straza turn next turn, he has Cobalt, Fireball, Frostbolt, and Ice Lance in hand, which is a n enough damage, but unfortunately just too much mana. So if, he, if he's able to split that up over two turns and beat the healing, which in this Druid deck, the healing is very much diminished. You know, most Malagos lists are playing two Feral Rages and one Moonglade Portal, mm -hmm. whereas this deck from Dr. Hippie is just playing one Feral Rage, so. Yeah, it definitely feels scary to me just to play the one Feral Rage, but the list, you know, has a different slant to it anyway with the teachers, yeah. et cetera. So, you know, it's completely understandable, just altered for different matchups. But yeah, as you said, we might see the Cobalt finally. It just hasn't had an impact this tournament, I don't think, in, in, in terms of actually, you know, burst damage finishes or anything like that. I'm not even particularly sure we've seen it in play so mm. far. He's just been winning, really, with the core Freeze Mage package without the need for the Kobold in his Freeze Mage game so far. So, you know, I, I would like to see the impact that his, his tech decision has on his tournament life here, but still, he does mm. need just one more piece of the puzzle here to have this be a, a, you know, a guaranteed development bar healing. Yeah, and he's in a really nice position as well, purely because the Ice Block is already live and he's at 22 right so you you're in such a secure i'm gonna get at least two turns yeah. at the very least and that's if things are crazy it's probably going to be three so it's really putting dr P in a unfortunate position here for him we have to think about what he needs to do here as he drops down the second arcane giant and just commits the two damage to face yeah, so he puts his opponent down to 19 and loads up 21 power on the board. He also has a nice pop at one now on the following turn if he wants to uh, if he wants to go for it with um, you know double giant attacking face plus a living roots plus a hero power that would be a nice clean pop at one. Uh, various other ways he can do it as well, but. George C now picking up an Ice Barrier as well. That's even more time. That's even more draws he has. And as I mentioned, he really only needs one more burn card here to be able to put this together exactly. or Emperor Thorasan. Yeah, th this is this looks like it could be the game for George C here. As just, again, the increase in delay is huge with the Ice Block always guaranteeing you one more turn unless Yogg cast Flare. There are many, many things you can say in Hearthstone that end with the caveat of Endless Yogg. And uh, Freeze Mage games are, are no exception to that. Yogg is, is always a, a last-ditch effort that you can make to, to try and pick up that much-needed flair. But the game is definitely not over. This isn't one of those auto-Freeze Mage no. situations. He's still looking for extra answers to his deck or, you know, extra initiative from his deck here. But he has so much time with the freezes, the secrets that he has in play, and now the extra ice barrier as well. Yeah, and it's always scary when you're playing against Freeze Mage and you know when they have that turn where it's like, okay, that's plus one turns. Oh, yeah. I'm afraid because it's plus one draws. Yep. Which means very much likely I'm going to follow up with a death. But it's going to be the second Fandral of this game into the Norwich, into a hell of a lot of cards and potentially some very impactful cards as Power of the Wild just, with Fandral on the board as well. You just innovate Norish again here. He, like, <laughs> Dr. Hippie needs that Feral Rage in his hand. He might just need that to beat the clock here. So drawing three more cards is a very big deal. Still has two mana available to him. There's the Feral Rage. That is huge. That now changes the equation in Dr. Hippie's favor by potentially an entire turn. And this, as you pointed out, you know, this is a, a matchup, any matchup against Freeze Mage, where you talk in turns, right? It's yeah. not, it's very much not, you know, who's ahead on the board, who has card advantage, who has tempo. It's how many turns does the Freeze Mage have? How many turns do they need? Yeah. That's why some people hate this deck, because it's very much focused on one side. And doesn't and very rarely, you know, comes down to, to pure interaction between the two decks. Yeah, so now another interesting position that Alex Straza can come down and there is fifteen damage from hand now with the second fireball being picked up. But the druid can hero power which is going to prove a problem in itself. The Druid already has three armor right now Yeah, as well. exactly. So e even if it was a pure 15, I mean, like, right. there's, when you're against Druid, there's always the plus one health guaranteed the next turn. Yep. 
So the, the Alex Straza would only put him down to 18, so he wouldn't even have the, the pop afterwards, even without any healing. As we said, the Feral Rage has been picked up, so now George C is just going to go. The two fireballs and the ping actually lower him further down than the Alex Straza would have done uh, because of that armor that he has in play. And now with Evol Evolved Cobalt, that's nine damage, uh, sorry, 11 damage from the Frostbolt or Ice Lance already, so he has the chance to add a second Frostbolt or Ice Lance to that for lethal from this position. Yeah, and that's going to be pretty huge. Judge C again, just identifying what he feels he needs to do to win this game in now the limited amount of turns he has, because this board is ridiculous. Interested by uh, him not using the, the Savagery there, Dr. Hippie, that turn, because is the Savagery any, ever getting any better? He has the pot without it, it's no problem. Yes, it's fine. So gaining the one extra armor from the hero power is just much, much better. Yep, you do anything you can to push yourself out of any crazy shenanigans. Oh, so close, yet so far with the Emperor. He just needed that card one or two turns sooner. And is this is this just going to be a spectacular collapse for the Freeze Mage here from George C after performing so well in this tournament so far? So well that Brian Kibler himself <laughs> has been quoted saying that he likes the deck. Yeah, that's when you know things, uh, you know, it becomes a dark day. But yeah, I don't know. I mean... The, the problem is, or maybe even the frustration for George, is that he, it's not like he's particularly even misplaying, playing badly. It's like he's just not getting what he needs. Yeah. And Dr. B is just piling on this much pressure. And when both players are playing to such a high level, if you just don't quite get what you need, you get punished pretty hard. Yeah, but now... Hippie has no choice. Now this becomes linear. Yeah. He has the rogue left. And so assuming that the mage rolls over the rogue as it is likely to do, very, very favored matchup, the rest of George's lineup now available to him is his his token druid, his mid-range hunter, and his aggro shaman. So like the, the rest of the lineup coming up against the rogue, you'd, you'd probably fancy the rogue to pick up a win somewhere along the line there, right? Which, you know, it's it's no great insight to say that the player that is 3-0 up in a series is favored to win, but the incredible collapse of the freeze mage for George C here, and just the, the stubbornness, honestly, for Hippie to just not expose his rogue has put him in such a comfortable position. Now. Yeah, you can't really argue it as we go straight into game four. No surprise, the Freeze Mage versus the Rogue. The matchup Judge C finally wanted. Yep. And we'll see if he can cash in on it. But not too much of a crazy start from Dr. Tippy. He's going to hold on to the Gadget Zan and the Tomb Pillager. The Tomb Pillager is like a guaranteed keep in this matchup. What do you think of the Gadget Zan? Do you think it's uh, you're planning a little bit too late? Is he, did he keep the gadgets out in his mind? I believe so, yeah. He only threw, the, uh, only threw the backstab. Well, what I will say about uh, Dr. Hippie's list is that he doesn't have that, that those huge early pressure minions like the um, the Questing Adventurers available to him. So he doesn't really have too much to mulligan for in terms of you know huge blowouts early on. Just that Argent Squire, really, is early game board development. Or try and mulligan for you know, just some ridiculous Edwin hand or something, yeah. which is so unlikely. So... Gadgetzan Auctioneer being such a, a powerful mid-game minion and such a linchpin to this fairly linear style of Miracle Rogue that Dr. Hippie is bringing. You know, just Leroy is an outright win condition, essentially. So um, having the Gadgetzan in his hand probably gives him the best shot because he's going to need to draw his deck quickly. And he's going to need enough resources in hand to consistently keep up pressure and demand, demand answers, demand freeze turns, demand removal every single turn that he can. Yeah, and uh, speaking of answers, Dr. Hippie's going to want to be able to answer this Doomsayer. Is. It's one of the best feelings against Rogue, playing a Doomsayer into their turn four. It's like, well, did you want to play that Tomb Pillager? Probably not going to bother this time. Yeah, so he, he does have the potential to answer it. It's very awkward. Uh, Redagger, Deadly Poison, Cold Blood, your 3-3 three, three and trade would be the answer, which is... Uh, and it just gets frostbolted and you're yeah, like, Yeah, uh. right. <laughs> That's a play that, that falls apart very, very quickly, and you probably rather reserve your Cold Blood as actual face damage in this matchup, but at the same time, handing initiative over this early just feels really terrible. Can you just really pass? Terrible. Exactly. <laughs> and like you can see, the, the expression on Dr. Hippie's face, he realizes his ticket to BlizzCon could be stamped by this decision right here. Yeah. It looks like he's just going to go for the dagger face. He's going to do it. Fair enough. This does keep the pressure up and at least requires an answer from George C. And, you know, George C has the answer fine. But at least he made him play the answer, yep. not just completely pass the turn over, because we can see George C's hand and it's like, yeah, just arcane intellect. Give me a free turn to draw two cards, let's go. I hope you like my 
Yeah, and uh, Dr. Hippie will get the uh, the small nugget of good news here that it's a bolt that's being used and not a Forgotten Torch, yeah. because at least that is a Frost Bolt down. Those are big cards to Freeze Mage. They need to have one of those Frost Bolts available to them to activate the Ice Lances in terms of burst damage, whereas Forgotten Torch is a card they are perfectly happy to fire at one of your minions because it just loads more burn back into the deck. Especially versus this style of Rogue, which is, you know, again, just doesn't have the huge minions where, you know what, as a Freeze Mage play, if you Ice Lance a huge Van Cleef, sure, because right. you've saved so much health, but there just aren't really those targets uh, yeah. as often in this deck because of the lack of quest inventories. Yep, very, very true. So now uh, Dr. Hippie developing the Drake here and just choosing, you know, how he wants to interact with this 1-1 potentially because it's a big waste of damage to send three damage into that um, into that novice engineer, but it potentially protects his Azure Drake from Forgotten Torch or Frostbolt. But has he established that his opponent does not have Forgotten Torch from the so previous he turn? He it in earlier. But would he? Because the Frostbolt allowed him too to, many play, mind games. to play a novice engineer in the same so turn. So stop, too many mind games. We're going too many levels deep. In All this. right, okay, fine. Back to the <laughs> meme cast. Ah, <laughs> where I feel most comfortable. <laughs> Okay, so we can see that there, in fact, aren't options for the Azure Drake to get punished too hard here by leaving the 1-1 up. So Dr. Tibby did manage to put some pressure on, and now George C does go into the Frostbolt. But as you said, do you want to Frostbolt it? It's kind of a tough question, because then the Ice Lance has become very that, mediocre. That is two dead draws in your deck if you use the Frostbolt here. So yeah, I, I don't think you can afford to use it. Definitely would have much preferred to, to uh, pick up or have a torch available to him. That conceal is now huge, either on this turn or over the next couple of turns. And also the decision here for Hippie is, does he want to conceal Auctioneer for card draw or does he want to try and conceal Violet Teacher for a big board push? Probably the Auctioneer is more beneficial mm. because you haven't seen any AoE come out from your opponent yet. You haven't asked any questions that demanded yeah. AoE yet. So. And you get blown out so hard if he just right. blizzards. Yeah, <laughs> it's, absolutely. Like, it's absolutely horrible. Second conceal. This is huge now because if he could, if he can get this board to attack next turn, if there is no freeze in hand for George C, he has the potential to just you know face face draw a bunch of cards, reconceal again at the end of the turn. But George C luckily does have that Blizzard available to him. He in fact has all four of the AOE freezes in his hand, so his stall potential very very high right now. Seems like you can't hide from a Blizzard. His stealth is not going to work here and. Yeah, you can you can hide from Yogg-Saron, you can't hide from a blizzard. <laughs> Seems reasonable. It does. Seems pretty fair. He's going to go for the Frost Nova, though. To be honest, ha has the same outcome to certain aspect because, you know, it allows him to develop the Ice Barrier and still stops the damage from the minions coming in, which is, I think, the biggest fear here because he couldn't have killed the gadgets on this turn anyway, so the draws are going to happen. Very true. Uh, Phantom Knife seems a natural starting point. I mean... Well, it depends whether he what he's, he's intending to play another minion this turn to conceal it. Because if he's playing another minion this turn, then obviously he wants to wait with the conceal. But if the conceal was always going to happen, then the conceal was probably best off being cast first so that he could potentially pick up preparation to go with his fan of knives and yeah. save more mana that way. So, and then really go big with a Van Cleave. Right. So, yeah, based, based on that turn happening in that order, I probably would have liked to see the conceal happen first. Yeah, because he's never going to hit Van Cleef anyway, right? Right. So there's no real problem of actually playing the conceal. Now George C has his target for the Blizzard, which again cannot be hidden from by the Gadgets and, and the Azure Drake. So they're going to take two damage and get frozen. And just going to, again, buy more time. This time George C has the Emperor for the reduction, mm -hmm. but only a Frostbolt for the burn and no Alex Straza to plan around. No Evolved Kobold either. Still yet to have an impact. Leroy is in hand to push damage, but remember, George C is at functional 30 health right now. That is an ice barrier in play, so 22 plus 8 is George C's current life total. And uh, Dr. Hippie just going to try and load up the biggest possible board that he can. Just try and desperately have some minions to attack with next turn to push through some damage, but the freezes are just going to keep on coming here. Yeah, we really C. see the difference in certain matchups with style of freeze mage, because the second you run a flame strike in your list, th this could not really happen as well because the rogue d wouldn't feel open to just go so wide on the board right. for fear of just completely getting locked down. And then the rogue just runs out of damage. So, you know, the effect of only running two blizzards here in George's list, even though it is, you know, like, other than the cobalt, the most common list knocking around. 
Yep. So going to start with the novice engineer here. He still has the opportunity of you know, Blizzard or Frost Nova to lock out this board here. He's going to use the Blizzard. So um, on a previous turn, there's there's two ways that you can look at the differences between Frost Nova and Blizzard. You know, generally, Blizzard is a more expensive card, so you can use it on one turn to allow you more flexibility on a yep. later turn with Frost Nova. But we saw on a previous turn. George C went the other way and actually used Frost Nova on a turn where he could have used Blizzard so that he could actually immediately develop Ice Barrier on the same turn. So, again, it's a mana rationing consideration as to which one of those two options you want to use. And turns like that make, is what makes Freeze Mage a hard deck to master. Because the second you misstep, you lose yeah. the game. <laughs> and that's, you know, and you can tell by these players that, you know, these guys know how to play this, this deck. And it's uh, impressive overall as Duck Tippy continues to pile on the pressure on his side of the board. And, not really too much damage in sight for George C. Still, there is the Fireball now to couple with the Frostbolt, but that is not enough when you not even got the Alex Straza in hand to plan around. Yeah, I mean, in, in most universes, this is the, the point in proceedings where a caster would say, George C. has probably played more games of Freeze Mage than any man alive. But unfortunately, we live in a universe where laughing exists, so that is probably not the case. But an incredibly still played a lot. experienced Freeze Mage player nonetheless. Okay, the old Shadow Strike to your own minion to double draw with the auctioneer because the Shadow Strike was on Thanos. Just get as much cycle as possible there and try is. and close the game out. There's the Cobalt. He's there. You can you can do it, buddy. Please, for us. Well, what's getting scary now is that if the Alex Strauss is drawn, and, and because of this Frost Nova again, as we talked about, by one more turn yeah. of damage, then this could very swiftly, like, change hands in terms of who seemed to have the advantage here at least. Right, and this was the long-term thinking of using Blizzard on the previous yep. turn instead of the Frost Nova. So the Frost Nova could be paired together with Emperor here, and now in his hand he has an Ice Block, he has a barrier that's developed, so he's at functional 30 health already. He has one guaranteed free turn from his Ice Block. He has an Ice Barrier to buy him some more turn if he, uh, uh, some more time if he is able to address this board. And he already has Fireball Frostbolt for 9 damage plus 4 damage extra from the Cobalt. He's up to 13 burst already from hand. Yeah, extremely scary, and this game is on a knife's edge. If Dr. Hippie wins, he will 4-0 in the finals and gain the champion title. But George C, this could be the beginning of the comeback. It could, and it's a long climb to come back against this rogue deck with uh, with some of the deck choices that he has. It's a long road back just from 0-3 down in the first place, but that Ice Lance He's getting very, <laughs> very close. That is 13 damage plus six bonus from the Kobold. 19 damage burst from hand now, plus pings over the two guaranteed turns he has. That's 21 damage now. So close. And this is, as you said, starting to just being able to ping away on those X amount of turns, yeah. just for those extra tiny points of damage. But it looks like it's an option of, do you actually play Doomsayer here just to try and soak up more damage? I think it's reasonable. I don't think you have any need for it here, but the important point is that your opponent's board is actually full here, which asks them questions. Because right now they only have, what, 11, 13, 18, 24 damage in play, and you are at functional 35? Which, when your opponent's board is full, one of the biggest ways they can add power to this board is with Leroy Jenkins. Yeah. So suddenly you're asking them to have to backstab their own minions, have that card in hand as well. They also can't play SI7 Agent for the same reason, which is another source of burst damage. Um, so this is a, a very, very, very big deal here for George C. Yep, and he does go with the Fireball because he's probably notifying that he's getting to the point where he's very likely to draw burn going forward and he can then combo it with the kobold if he draws into the torches for example his fireball costs three that turn right so his total burn turn would be co kobold fireball for six frostbolt ice lance for eight still have mana for the ping i'm not sure of the necessity of throwing a fireball at face that turn uh I, I, okay i guess what he's playing around is the the eventuality where this plan to buy an entire turn without his ice block getting popped, where that doesn't work, he gives himself more outs yeah, to way draw to actually additional end the burn this yeah. way. Okay, and we are going to see the backstab from Duck TP be able to make some room there onto the board. As you quite rightly said, it was full, and that can get very awkward very quickly. And also, Earthen Ring Farseer in the list. Not too common in Rogue at all, but this might be the, the card doesn't look like the craziest card in the world, but it might be the one that pushes him just out of range. Might 
B. And uh, yeah, Dr. Hippie is trying, scrambling for a way to try and pop the ice block this turn because he is terrified of another turn coming out from George C. He gets the sad news that he just doesn't have it, has to heal himself, goes back up to 20. George C. This draw is again, so important. Down to seven life plus four from the Cobalt up to 11. That fireball is eight more damage, which makes 19. Coin ping for the win, I believe, for George C. Which <laughs> the means Cobalt! The Cobalt has justified himself. It's not a tempo Cobalt, <laughs> but it's a Cobalt that's winning the game nonetheless. Very well played from George C. And the key to that is the fireball on the previous turn, yeah. which looked strange. Yeah, and again, it's just the the skill cap on this deck is frankly pretty ridiculous. And we can see those kind of lines where, you know, we were looking at it going, okay, you know, why was this fireball happening? And yeah. then we saw exactly why, as it lined up the victory in the end. Yeah, so it took, we've seen it take four shots for Dr. Hippie to get a win with his Dragon Warrior in a previous series. It took four shots on the other end of the equation, starting out the series, in this case for George C, to pick up a win with his Freeze Mage. But he's now going to have to complete the 3 0 sweep back the other way over the Miracle Rogue list. And honestly, this Miracle Rogue list is one of the weird looking decisions about Dr. Hippie's lineup. You know, I'm, I really wasn't a big fan of his lineup coming in. Yeah, and we will see if George C can start to climb back in this series versus Dr. Hippie straight after this. And we are back with what could be the beginning of George C climbing back and reverse sweeping Dr. Hippie. This is turned out to be a pretty crazy series considering it looked like it was over pretty soon. Yeah, but we've seen this situation from both of these players so far this tournament. You know, Dr. Hippie was in a comfortable 3-0 spot before and his Dragon Warrior started to fall apart a little bit and he was pushed all the way to 3-3. George C himself has already 4-0 swept his opening series of the tournament. So that's, you know, he just has to do that again. You yeah. know, it doesn't matter it's that fine. he's he do started again. out 3-0 <laughs> down. He's just saying, okay, I'm I'm so good. You have a 3-0 start this game. I've been 4-0-ing my opponents anyway. No big deal. What's scary is I could imagine George C's level of confidence being like that. <laughs> he could be like, yeah, it's fine. I'll take that, it. It does sound like a thing <laughs> he might say, yeah. Yep, so... The, the win with the Freeze Mage did finally happen. So, at last, for Kibler's sanity, we will no longer be casting Freeze Mage games. I thought you were going to say, finally, for, for Brian Kibler, who is now a massive fan <laughs> of Freeze Mage, <laughs> thankfully it has won. <laughs> yeah. I went for the more realistic option there. Fair. So, we are going to see the Shaman here from George C, the, the aggressive Shaman list, the, the modern aggressive Shaman list with the, the Maelstrom portals included, which not, you know, not all the players who brought aggressive Shamans in this tournament have gone with the up-to-date list, but you know, George C, one of the players who is favoring some of the new Karazhan cards, and uh, Dr. Hippie's hand is unspectacular, <laughs> shall we say. Very polite. Yeah. Uh, yeah, not great at all, whereas George C, you know, the, the turn two, whether it's versus the Hero Power or the Finley, not really the worst case scenario when he has a good follow-up in terms of the flexibility of Feral Spirit or Portal and Finley the following turn, or even just Finley Hero Power, because it depends if he's going to go for Feral Spirit or if he's going to be extremely afraid, uh, not afraid of the sap and hold off to try and go for the four mana Flamely Faceless. And uh, the Shadow Strike is a good pickup against Shaman. It generally lines up pretty well against a Totem Golem. You know, it's just a, a three mana for three mana exchange. Once you factor in Overload, it also helps you chew through a, a Flame Wreath Faceless if you don't have the Sap available. But there is only so long as a Rogue and as most classes in Hearthstone that you can survive purely by answering your opponent's minions with spells. Because at one point, you're just going to whiff, yeah. and then you, the pressure will overrun you. you. You need to be able to fight back on the board with minions. Dr. Hippie yet to draw a single minion this <laughs> game, and this is just what's known in the business as a Miracle Rogue hand. <laughs> yeah, and this is very similar, reminiscent of what's happened yesterday with his Dragon Warrior. As to be honest, a couple of the games he lost was lost because of a terrible opening hand as in a, and his opponent really, you know, banking on that and making moves forward, sort of identifying that their opponent had pretty much nothing mm -hmm. and getting really aggressive. And this is the list to do it from George C. So prep, Shadow Strike, Eviscerate, Concede from Dr. Hippie. No, he's not going to go with the Concede <laughs> finisher to the combo there, just uh, passes the turnover, but he's going to need to pick up some particularly spectacular options very, very quickly with two Conceals in hand. A Gadgetzam will do it. There it oh, is. Call 
got them. So he's bought himself enough time with the removal turn on the previous turn that he can probably now just about survive this pressure up until his Gadgetan turn, because he still has the coin available to him as well. Yeah, but importantly as well, he still needs to needs to make big things happen after the Gadgetan, because yep. he's really used a lot of things. removal, he's used prep, uh, he's used Shadow Strike, so you know he's going to really need to cycle in and hope George C runs out of steam, and we can see that is more than likely just not going to happen as, again, with the Finley coming down, the Hero Power will be super interesting here. The quickest Hunter Hero Power click I've ever seen, and trust me, I've seen some quick ones. Yeah, that is so much pressure now. This board, since Blade Flurry has... I, I, I always want to say since Blade Flurry rotated out of standard. Retired. Yeah, that's that's not quite what happened, but since uh, since since Blade Flurry received the nerf hammer and has not really seen too much play since, if any at all, this kind of board where, you know, wide board with more than two health on each individual target, so it's out of range of spell damage fan of knives, this is just the nightmare scenario for Rogue to be able to deal with. Yeah, Blade Flurry definitely wanted to retire early from competitive Hearthstone. And we do see the sap A bit like Savits. Yes, exactly like Savits. So, <laughs> Sorry. We can see Savits as well, so it makes it even better. But the sap coming out onto the Spirit Wolf gives George C a bit of a nod that, hey, you know, there's one sap gone. Yep. You know, it's a pretty good card. 4 mana 7-7. Seven, seven. So it means that's going to be more open for him in the following turns. And now we're just seeing being a bit, making the choice between just locking the Doom Hammer in, which again is just another powerful card that's going to end this game very quickly, or going for the 7 7. But this means you can play the Feral Spirit as well. And there's always the Hunter Hero Power now to just keep chipping away and ending the game. I'm actually surprised that we even saw the 7 7 come down here. I just, the, the, the Doom Hammer just seemed like such a clear and obvious lethal setup over the next few turns that the risk of second sap being there plus some sort of absolute insanity with prep uh seemed like a weird you know one percent world where you can win that game but that draw was just so abysmal from yeah. hippie that it was just never going what to was happen. it turn four he still didn't have a minion yeah his first minion was a gadgetan that he drew on turn five which still wasn't playable so. yeah. yeah. kind of crazy overall but george c there getting another quick win as well so now the momentum's starting to build and hippie Honestly has to be thinking about what nearly happened yesterday when he nearly lost to like a boss and being able to potentially reverse all kill there So the pressure, you know, Hippie's a very experienced player, but the pressure overall is Must be starting to mount right now. It really sh it really must. Yeah, and that's that's two very That's two of the easier wins for George C out of the way now against this rogue. Yeah, aggro shaman Extremely favored if the, even if the rogue does get a good hand, it's favored because you know they, they just die to Doomhammer. Yeah. They, they have no outs to the card them. Doomhammer. Yeah. You just 16 them, you grab a rock biter, they just die. Even packing one Earth and Ring Farsi are generally not going to be good enough. Now there are some matchups coming that are a little bit trickier to navigate. And you are a more experienced hunter player than I, Raven, but I for a long time have felt that this is a stronger matchup for Hunter than people give it credit for. I think people boil this matchup down far too simply to, oh, you can sap Savannah high mains. There are a lot more interactions in this matchup than that. Yeah, in this matchup, a lot of the time, you, it's very similar to the Flame with Faceless we saw in the, in the Shaman match. Like, yeah. a lot of the time, you don't even try and play it unless you've got you know literally no other choice because the sap is too much of a tempo swing. But you look at all the other cards, and they're actually super awkward to deal with for the rogue. The yeah. rogue needs very specific answers, and the second it misses, the hunter just punishes you with just raw pressure and damage overall, and the rogue, a lot of the time, can't keep up. But what I will say is, I'm not sure, you Judge C's list specifically with, like, the double jugglers is just not quite the same sort of super heavy death rattle pressure list mm. that's been played most commonly, like uh, the Nazoth list, for example. But, you know, you can still get some work done with it, even though Dr. B picking up the Argent Squire early on is pretty huge. Yeah, sure is. The the one of Argent Squire being in the opening hand here is an extremely big deal because it now ties his hand together so nicely. And now just an embarrassment of riches really in hand for Dr. Hippie. Chooses to go with the Fan of Knives option here, keeping his backstab SI7 agent combination together for a following turn. But he had so many ways 
to deal with that knife juggler. You know, trade with the Divine Shield, trade with your weapon, and just play an SI7 agent on the board as a 3-3 isn't the worst thing in the world. It's exposed to Eagle Horn Bow, but, you know, you're grabbing so much tempo so early against the Hunter that it's quite often hard for them to fight back. Yeah, exactly. And these are the kind of answers we were talking about earlier. And if the Rogue can just stay, just about stay on top of the early threat and early power, power curve that Hunter is pretty much known for, yeah. then it has a really good chance at just ending the game because one of the problems is Hunter very much struggles to respond when it's behind. Like that's the real issue. But I like the coin wolf out from Jug. She needs to continue piling on the pressure. The Eagle Horn bow does very little here as the Argent Squire being the only real threat on the board. And you don't just want to go face if you're you know on the back foot with minion pressure. And this is great from Hippie. I love this decision. You know, we talked about, you know, if you if you ask any, you know, moderate level Hearthstone player, you know, a player that's that's capable of hitting legend but isn't necessarily, you know, a competitive player, yeah. put it that way, you know. What's the first thing you know about the Rogue matchup with Hunter as well? Don't get your high main sapped, but the thing that you can't teach and that separates some of these players as to being some of the best players in Europe and in the world is that every game of Hearthstone is different. And Dr. Hippie identifies that he had the chance there with a Tomb Pillager to say, this is not a high main game. This is not a game where I just need to sap a high main. I can start pushing pressure through right now. Yeah, I mean, you know what? High main's not much of a problem when you've already won by that turn. Right. So yeah, I really like it. And George C's response there with the fire bat and the kill command was the respect he needed to show because otherwise he was really going to fall behind. But that was literally the only available answer, yeah. right? On four mana, exactly fiery back kill command was necessary because not even deadly shot was guaranteed because he had that extra 1-1 one, one insurance on the board. Yeah, the only other option realistically just would have been replay wolf yep. and hope for a better sh shot next turn. Yep. You know, that's the only option. So Judge C very good there to be able to clear up the Tomb Pillager is a big threat. And now that tip is running a little bit dry even though he does have the Thalnos for a second draw this turn. This is kind of tough though because... Okay, he's going to trade. It's like you value the, the draw over the potential damage you're going to take from the hero power. Yeah, Since yeah. it is only two and you're on 28, right. you've not been pressured early from the hunter. Also, you value having the backstab in your hand because one of the tools you need, or the biggest tool you need to get back into this game is a Gadgetzan Auctioneer, in which case, again, you'd rather have that backstab in your hand much, much more than you would a Thalnos on the board. Yeah. Now we see, I really like this from George. The bat is just going to die to the weapon, mm -hmm. at, at least. Or you can just guarantee two damage right. and save the bat for a turn you can slip it into next turn. As the seven mana is normally, uh, it can be a little bit awkward sometimes and just having the extra one drop to just to fill your curve out is really nice. So I, I love the hail power every turn from George. Again, situation we've talked about a lot. Infested Wolf, just so awkward. Like how do yeah. you interact with this minion as a rogue? You don't, you sap it. We saw that before. <laughs> He's just, just, just gonna sap, sap it, it again. <laughs> I mean, suddenly this looks like it could be a high main game, yeah. right? I mean, the, the read that after one sap has been used from Dr. Hippie's perspective, you know, one sap has been used. My opponent didn't play a high main on turn six. Yeah. He probably doesn't have a high main in hand because Thank he would you. think I don't have the second sap, but George C has exactly the same response yeah. if he wants to the Tomb Pillagers. Tearing apart these Tomb Pillagers, and the, the Infested Wolf is just going to come right back down again. Second kill command, and now all of a sudden... Game on for Hippie the Hunter. is out of gas in hand, and this one looks like Grand Finals could be going all the way to seven. Yeah, and George C now in the position where, because Dr. Hippie hasn't really played too many minions, he's not been able to deal with and not done enough early damage, it means that on 20 health, you're feeling pretty reasonable being able to, you know, in terms of health, to be able to claw back into this game. But this is rough. That is a huge turn. Dr. Hippie has, uh, has made a habit of drawing one damage AOE in when very, very it. crucial points. <laughs> combined this, with spell power. In this tournament so far, yeah, combined <laughs> specifically with spell damage. And George C, still no high mains, still no Call of the Wild. With, you know, one of the, the best AoEs, as limited as it is, in Fan of Knives gone already, and both Saps gone already. If those power cards are now drawn from George C, they are crushingly powerful in this matchup, but he's just whiffing on those big power tools as the Hunter here. Yeah, and I really like this play again, going wide on the board, and then Animal Companion is always better when you've got minions on the board already, mainly because of Leoc, but also... Misha defends those minions, right? You sure. know, so there, there are multiple good options there. And I like just playing the one drops and more importantly, weaving in the hero power. I think 
we may just see Dr. Hippie engage a race here. It might just be his only out from this situation. I don't think he wins this game long term on the board. So something like Dagger Up, Deadly Poison, SI7 Agent, the face and just push sets you up for Leroy Eviscerate on the following turn. Forces the Hunter to trade into you if they don't have lethal themselves. Yep, it looks there like that's go. exactly where we are going. Dr. Hippie is making the push for the yeah, championship win good. here. Yeah, this is better. He can afford to SI a minion, of course, because he has uh, Leroy Eviscerate plus the uh, Deadly Poison. And, and it also like time. opens up less possible return trades Correct. as well yep. from the Hunter. And Barnes is not what George C. wants to see here. Uh, this is pretty rough. Uh, pretty much can just play his whole hand. To, uh, or at least not his whole hand, but play with everyone's out of his hand in combos of two. And I just don't know what's going to be enough. Kind of grandmother is not looking great here. That is not a taunt. This no. is 33% chance to hit Misha here. George <gasps> C's tournament life is on the line. He chooses not to go for it. He's just dead to hand. <laughs> Wow, and he's had, and the thing is, Dr. Pete's had those cards. He knows two are coins, but he's also had Leroy in his hand for so long. What else could that card be? It's it's tough to say, but George C says that the chance to roll a taunt is not worth it. Cold Blood is picked up as an unnecessary, already has the damage in hand. Dr. Hippie, the redemption story is complete. He is going to get that chance for the rematch, the revenge match against his good friend, Naaman at BlizzCon. Yeah, and he said he was going to do it. He was confident from day one, and he has an extremely uh, impressive performance overall from both of these players. But Doc Tippy really banked in there and just been able to get those repeat wins after win after win versus those freeze mages of George C. Yeah, either way, either of these players would have been a fantastic European champion, a fantastic you know, member of the, the BlizzCon cast for our world champions, world championship, sorry, but, you know, Dr. Hippie in particular, his consistency, even above and yeah. beyond what George achieved, two grand finals he's made it to at European championships now, and now he gets his big shot to take revenge over Neyman at BlizzCon. Yeah, and even his continued performances as well, like in other tournaments outside this, right. playing with his team versus pro, his teammate Neyman as well and it's just been he's just an incredible player every time I watch him play like every single turn he's like yes okay I get it you know there's nothing you can really argue with almost all the time and we just see it like you just see it in his performance there but Doc Tippy is with Frodan Fireside for his winner's interview after six grueling games, we have a champion for the Europe Summer Region. Go ahead and present to Dr. Hippie from Ukraine. I want to ask a few reaction questions before we go ultimate to the analysis and the final exit interview. The first is, how sweet is this victory considering that in the winter season you also got to the finals but was denied by your teammate? <laughs> He can describe it with, he doesn't have enough words to describe, it's just amazing. There's a lot of people that also support you as well from Ukraine. There's people showing all kinds of pictures of how they're watching you while playing in their local taverns. What's that support mean to you as well? It means really a lot to him and thank you to everyone who was supporting and rooting for him. Absolutely heartwarming, Stormy. Raise that trophy one more time. Once again, pre I present to you the summer champion for the European region is Dr. Hippie. We've had an excellent season so far. Congratulations to everyone who finished top eight. This is the last seasonal spot that we give, as well as last call in the next month. But for now, we're done over on this side of the stage. We'll do an interview with Dr. Hippie in just a few minutes. For now, let's head to the round table for some analysis on what we watched and what we can expect coming up in the following weeks. Thanks very much, Frodan. Oh, oh, look at that. Huh. <laughs> Dr. What do you Hippie. know? And my stat holds true as well. It does. It does. 100% of players that have made it to two finals have won one of them. I mean, there's about a 50% chance that would hold up. So, well done. <laughs> yeah. But uh, big, big congratulations to Dr. Hippie for winning. Uh, he'll join Handsome Guy as the second player to make it to a finals and come back and, and get revenge or uh, against a different opponent, I suppose. So, uh, Brian Kidd, what do you think of Dr. Hippie's run? Uh, I mean, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. 
he felt like he was disadvantaged going into that finals match. But we saw in his games against George C's Freeze Mage just how much he understood all of what that deck was capable of. He was able to maneuver around what uh, George C was able to potentially do on his turns every single turn and really took advantage of that. Yeah, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the final bracket uh, for the Europe Summer Championship and uh, see exactly Dr. Hippie's run through. And there you can see, defeated George C in the finals, Diz Demon in the semifinals, and Like a Baus in the quarterfinals. A pretty tough road to become the champion, Savitz. Yeah, certainly. He made it so close in the Winter Championships, and now this time he was able to win it all. Struggled a little bit in his quarterfinal with this uh, Dragon Warrior, but it wasn't an issue. He made it through, and uh, quite, a, quite a nice final to watch. I really enjoyed it. Well played by Dr. Hippie touted as being one of the best freeze mage players in the world throughout winter and of course uh, across the past couple months competing in other tournaments but brought tempo mage the only player to bring tempo mage and he made it all the way all the way to the the finals and, and won it so uh a, a little bit crazy to see dr hippie's road uh, but we're not gonna bore you guys anymore with with crazy analysis of some of the matches we're gonna get right over into the interview with dr hippie to hear his thoughts with frodan all right, congratulations, Dr. Hippie. We just want to talk a little bit more about your victory in depth. And of course, we have our lovely interpreter with us as well. Uh, so the first question I want to ask you was, uh, you know, now that you've seen the actual matchups, did you really think you were that unfavored against George? No, I think I was a little bit behind him, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I'm sorry, it happened, but it's a good thing for him to win. Well, he felt uh, in the beginning that the George was uh, a little bit more in favor with his decks. Um, he even feels a little bit sad. That <laughs> it happened, but right. he's happy that he's going to BlizzCon. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're happy. You're saying that you're sad because, you know, you were beating his freeze mage a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go ahead and talk about, just from the very beginning, um, your tempo mage up against freeze mage. Um, George was saying while he was sitting us with the back that he really feels that freeze mage is favored in that matchup, but I know a lot of people also consider tempo mage to be good against freeze mage as well. What are what are your thoughts on that deck specifically in that matchup? I think it's probably chance to win with tempo mage and freeze mage. It depends on the player. Tempo Maha and how he knows how to play against Frismaha. Do you think he's the best player of the game? Yes. So, I believe that chances are equal between Tempo Mage and Freeze Mage. But now, it depends on the experience of the player. Ah, okay. Well, it's interesting because I think you know the Freeze Mage side from his side as well, which is really cool. Um, and in general, uh, one, one more time, why don't you explain why you chose to bring Tempo Mage and not Freeze Mage, which you're so known for? Частично из ставки Life Coach против Лафина. Частично из-за этого, но по большей части я хотел выиграть, поэтому не взял Freeze Mage. Не могу сказать точно почему, но так так случилось. Еще раз первый раз, что ты сказал? Частично из-за ставки? Да, ставки Life Coach против Лафина. Скажи. Против? Лаффинга. Лаффинга. Лаффинга? Окей. Да, его имя Лаффинга. Окей, так, партли это было из-за, вы знаете, отзывы между Лаффинга, я думаю. Лаффинга, да, да. Он известный фрезмейдж 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 Good. Yeah, well, I mean, the Temple Mage ended up uh, winning, which was very successful. Um, let's talk also about your second deck, the Midrange Shaman. Again, a lot of people have been thinking the aggressive version of Shaman. Uh, Why did you choose to bring Midrange, and how did you feel playing up against uh, George with it? I usually play a lot of Midrange Shaman, I usually play a lot of Agro Shaman, but I thought it was better for him, because I was waiting for many Agro Shaman, and Midrange plays better against Agro. Oh, well, he expected that... Um Many people will bring Agro Shaman, which he does prefer to um, Midrange Shaman. So, but that's why that was the reason why he brought Midrange Shaman, and he thinks it could play a little bit better against um, the decks that George had. Gotcha. So, and, and 
Specifically, he knew that it'd be a very effective strategy too. Um, you know, d a lot of people are looking at this mid-range shaman. They think it's one of the best decks for ladder. Has a very high win rate. Do you agree with that? Do you think this mid-range shaman, um, who people who see this deck, should they be playing that on ladder? Is that the best deck right now? Конкретно мой мишаман ужасен, думаю. Так что не советую им играть. Но мид-рейндж шаман сейчас чувствует себя хорошо. Ты говоришь ужасен твой мид-рейндж шаман? Well, he thinks that his mid-range shaman is a little bit terrible, <laughs> so he wouldn't advise others okay. to do the same. To not to do the same as him, but yeah. to play mid-range shaman, you think it's okay? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. What what makes your mid-range shaman terrible? No. Почему ты думаешь, что он ужасен? Немножко ужасен твой мид-range shaman. Я услышал мысли Лоина и понял, что мой мид-range shaman ужасен. He heard some some thoughts of Loin. Ah, uh, Loin, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> that's that's what makes him think that now. Okay, that's cool. He's consulting other players. Loin, of course, finished uh, in the top four of spring season, for people who don't know, for the Europe Championships. Your third deck was uh, Token Druid. Why did you choose to bring Token Druid and not the Malagos version that everyone's been playing in recent times? I've uh, been Хантеров, поэтому я решил взять Мидранч. Я ожидал много Мидранч Хантеров, поэтому я решил взять Токен Дрида. Он играл с ним получше. So he expected to have lots of midrange hunters, and this is why he brought uh, Token Druid. Yeah, and it was. He I think they play good. better again. It plays better against those. Yeah, I, I can definitely see that, and it seemed to be pretty effective. I mean, you wouldn't change anything about that, right? You'd still bring the Token Druid. Yeah, versus the Malagos Druid. I mean, do you have opinions on that too? People are saying Malagos Druid might even be the best deck in the game. Um, that doesn't change your lineup, but what, what do you think about that? Because some people want to play this on ladder too, because they think it's a really exciting deck. Все зависит от зависит от мета, но сейчас я думаю, все-таки Malagos посильнее будет, чем Дранч, но конкретно на этом турнире нет. Теперь еще раз и понятнее немножко, не так быстро. Я думаю, что Мали Гост получше будет, но на этом турнире конкретного нет. I think that Mali God would be a little bit better, but um, not for this championship. Gotcha, yeah. So it makes uh, a better overall deck, but for the tournament specifically prepared. And the last, uh, oh sorry, not the last, but the last deck that you played in the series is Miracle Rogue. Um, Rogue is always in a very interesting spot. Some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, why, why bring Rogue to this championship? What were you planning for it? Изначально у меня был план банить агро шамана, но как оказалось, все играют контроль воинами. Я ожидал больше драйн воинов. Как по мне, Рога довольно неплохо играет с драйн воином, поэтому я взял ее и ожидал больше изу, но так случилось, что нет. А, какие войны? Еще раз. Я, а... я ожидал больше драйн воинов, но тут оказался больше контроль. He expected more dragon warriors, but apparently there were more control warriors. <laughs> yeah. So that we was the reason why he brought um, Miracle Rogue. Plus, I expect more zoo. Yeah, 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 more zoo as well. Which I mean, only two people brought it, which was uh, really surprising. Um, but I mean, it still seemed to work out okay. A lot of people. I mean, how, how do you feel about Rogue right now? Do you think it's a good tournament pick, a good ladder pick, or or none none of those? Я думаю, это всегда хороший пик, хороший пик на турнире, но в ладере я не уверен, что он хорошо играет. He thinks it's a very good choice for a championship, but not always in a ladder. Yeah. Especially in best of seven. Yeah, 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 because you can have some decks where it's good against. So be careful at home, kids. Try not to just go on ladder with Rogue. You, you might get yourself in trouble. The last one, of course, is Dragon Warrior. I think uh, you're the only one who brought the faster version of Dragon Warrior. Someone brought Control Dragon Warrior. Everyone else brought Control Warrior. Um, you know, wh wh why did you think that it was still okay to bring and everyone else disagreed? Частично из-за того, что я ожидал много агрошаманов, много дридов, как сказал Зигнамон, так себе играют. И это был совет Неймана, поэтому взял его. So first of all, that was Neyman's advice. And he expected a lot of uh, agroshamans and dru druids. And that was the reason why he picked Dragon Warrior. Oh, very astute. I mean, shamans were very popular, for sure, and you're able to do it. Um, and, I mean, people 
may have forgotten about uh, Dragon Warrior, but it's still a very good ladder deck, right? That most people have forgotten. I believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no question there. All right. That's pretty much uh, all the questions that we wanted about the decks. Uh, I did have one question. Uh, Sato tweeted out yesterday on Twitter that you're actually trolling the entire Western community, that your English is better than Ravens. Is that true? Are you trolling us? No, no. Same, man. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm actually a little sick this week. <laughs> You're triggering me, Dr. Hippie. Well played, well played. I don't really have anything else. Do you want to say anything? To, uh, I know the Russian community has been watching. Uh, their viewership is spiked like crazy to support you. You can go ahead and just address the community as you'd like. Спасибо всем, кто меня поддерживает. Постараюсь выступить хорошо на Брисконе. Желаете больше тренера со мной? Смотрите. Спасибо. Thank you so much for supporting me and um, keep watching. Um, keep supporting me during the Blizzcon. Um, so just keep watching. Love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. It's been a pleasure so far to have three of our finalists from Europe to go to BlizzCon. Uh, we're not done with all the championships for the summer season, but we do want to remind you guys about a couple things, too. Next week, we'll have the Asia Pacific region that will be battling out for their eight players and one spot. That's going to be happening September 30th and October 1st at 9 p.m. Pacific here on Twitch.tv slash Play Hearthstone. We also want to say that Jorsey won't be too far away. He's going to be coming back to the last call quality fire to play for his chance one more chance for george and that's again another amazing storyline that we like to carry out for the rest of the year but we're pretty much done here from frodo and the rest of the casters dr hippie our champion and everyone else here as part of the hearthstone championship tour thanks for watching and we'll see you next time